Um, but, but the issue, I think, with the ADL is not a question of hate speech. It's not a question of anti-social semitism, obviously. Uh, it's that the ADL um, and a lot of other organizations have become activist organizations uh, which are acting far beyond their uh, stated mandate or their original mandate. And, and I think far beyond what donors to those organizations think they are doing. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that the ADL was extremely opposed to, and in fact was instrumental in, in happening, was that the ADL was instrumental in getting um, Donald Trump the platform. Um, and then when we, 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 you know, we restored the account, um, they, they, they made it super clear that they regarded simply restoring his account on, you know, Twitter, now X, uh, that, that, that constituted hateful speech. Well, like, he hasn't even said anything, you know. Um, he has to at least say something or post something for there to be incremental hateful, hateful content. This is absurd. Um, and what's this got to do with anti-Semitism? Like, you know, Donald Trump's son-in-law is Jewish, his Jewish country, so I'm pretty sure he's not anti-Semitic, okay? Um, you know, it's at the wedding. <laughs> so, um, this, this, so, so, so the problem is that a lot of these um, organizations, like I so, said, they've really been captured by the woke agenda, and they're, they're pushing, um, you know, a series of beliefs and values that I think are often uh, contrary to their, what, what their donors believe. Hey, and that's, uh, that's what we have in this situation. Um, then, with respect to, now that's it, I, I think I understand China well. I've been there many times, I've met with uh, the senior leadership um, uh, at many levels of China for, for many years. And so I, I think I've got a pretty good understanding, of, um, at least as an outsider of China. So, and, it, and Tesla has been very successful domestically in China. So, um, you know, the, the fundamental thing here is is really Taiwan. Um, the uh, China has, well, really since uh, for like half a century or so, uh, maybe longer at this point, much longer at this point, the, the, their, their policy has been to, to um, sort of re reunite Taiwan with China. Uh, from this standpoint, it, you know, it maybe it's analogous to like Hawaii or, or something like that, like an integral part of China that is arbitrarily not part of China, um, mostly because of the, the U.S. Uh, stopped, has been, the U.S. Pacific fleet has stopped uh, any, any sort of um, reunification effort force. Um, so now, really, things getting to the point um, increasingly year over year, uh, where China's military strength is increasing, and ours is more or less uh, static. And strategically, you know, you can imagine trying to defend Taiwan is not not easy because uh, it's it's very close to the coast of China. Um, so there will come a point, if you know, pro probably not in the not too distant future, where. China's military strength in that region far exceeds U.S. military strength in that region. And if one is to take uh, China's policy literally, and probably one should, um, then there will be some forceful, uh, for, force will be used for, you know, uh, to incorporate Taiwan into China. This is what they've said, um, that if, if there's not a diplomatic solution, there will be a solution by force. Let me... Um... Um, and so, really, what's going on here, and you're seeing, you know, this in, in many areas, and I think this tempo is going to increase, is that, you know, both China and the U.S. are preparing for a potential showdown, uh, you know, in the South China Sea. So um, that's why you're seeing increasing restrictions on export of U.S. technology to China, uh, such as the, the NVIDIA's, you know, the NVIDIA H100 is being banned, you're not allowed to ship it to China. Um, and I think there'll be more and more, you, you're also not allowed to, not allowed to ship uh, advanced chip making equipment to China. Um, so, and I suspect, you know, you know China's going to respond with some reciprocal sanctions. Um, and you'll, I think you'll see this kind of a tit for tat, uh, reciprocal sanctions uh, increasing in the next, next few years. So I think quite a very uh, hot temperature, um, and then we'll see this. Is there going to be a diplomatic solution to your uh, re reunification or a non-diplomatic solution? You, uh, but you, you just made it clear that there will, one way or another, be a solution <laughs> from this standpoint. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Nvidia, so let me just talk about AI and bring it back to that for a second. Can you tell us um, your Regrets, but also the positives of the experience you had with OpenAI, and then what your goals are with uh, XAI. 
Well, the, the AI discussion is, is certainly a long one, <clears throat> or could be a long one. Um, it, you know, uh, digital superintelligence uh, might be the most significant technology that humanity ever creates. Um, and, and it has the potential to be more dangerous than um, nuclear weapons. So, um, you know, in the case of creating open AI, it was to have, have there not be a unipolar world where um, Google, with its subsidiary DeepMind, uh, you know, would control an overwhelming amount of AI talent and compute and, and resources, uh, which then is somewhat dependent on basically how that, that how Larry Page uh, and, and Sergey Brin um, and Eric Schmidt believe things should go, because they, they cream through them, which two out of three have control over Alphabet, because they've got super voting rights. And, um, you know, it's quite so based on some conversations I had with Larry Page, uh, where, um, you know, he did call me a speechist for being <laughs> pro-humanity. And um, so I'm like, what side are you on, Larry? You know, uh, not ours, we would say. Um, you know, I think, and uh, so, so you know, I felt like uncomfortable um, having the entire future of digital superintelligence be in the hands of someone who called me a speechist uh, for being pro-humanity. Um, you know, how can it not be? Uh, so, that's yes, opening eye was originally created as an open source nonprofit, and now is a closed form. It appears to be, it should be renamed closed for maximum profit AI. Um, <laughs> it, is, it is closed, um, and they are aiming to, I think, make, try to make $100 billion, I think, according to Sam Altman, uh, get $100 billion from somewhere for some vast amount of compute uh, to create digital God. Um, Apparently, all the, the waste is stored in a comma separated value file, by the way. So, our digital god will be a CSV file. <laughs> How do we import it? <laughs> file yeah, import just god. Yeah, you know. um, see what happens. Um, so, so now, anyway, the, so, so now uh, opening eyes uh, is also very closely aligned with Microsoft. You know, Microsoft is really. You know, um, the open AI servers are running on in, in Azure and Microsoft data centers. You know, my, so really what you have is, I think at the end of the day, Microsoft having more control than open AI. Uh, they have access to all the source code, they have access to all the weights of the um, you know, GP4 and future versions. So they have all rights to this to, to think. It's not, um, at, at any point really they could cut off open AI. And I don't think open AI quite realizes that the dependence on, on Microsoft. And even if Microsoft does break some contract, they'll just be tied up in litigation for, you know, for years. Um, so really you've got a contest between kind of like Google and Microsoft. Google, as I mentioned, I'm concerned about, you know, uh, Larry not, not caring enough about AI safety and um, good reason. And then Microsoft just is, is a, I think, you know, a, a profit-seeking organization. Um, and I, you know, I think such is great, but um, I, I can't say like, you know, that it would be difficult to, to say that, that Microsoft has a has an amazing track record in moral decision making. <laughs> so, uh, diplomatic. Yeah. Yeah.